Um, hi everyone, we're here to talk to you today about the extraction of resveratrol from muscadine grapes. I'm Cassie Clementi. I'm Alan Denninger. Kurt Oakman. And I'm Ryan Mueller. So the problem that we're addressing, like I said, is the extraction of resveratrol from muscadine grapes. We have also developed an efficient process and business strategy for large-scale production of resveratrol for distribution. In addition, our other goal was to market a relatively unknown dietary supplement to the general population. So our source of interest um, initially came from the French paradox, um, which is basically that French people are known to have lower incidence of cardiovascular disease despite their diet being um, high in saturated fat. So this was um, sort of discovered that resveratrol is in red wine, which was believed to be the reason for um, this French paradox. So there are several sources of resveratrol, and we decided to choose muscadine grapes because they're low cost, easy to produce, and have great health benefits. And also because the pharmaceutical and nutritional supplement industries are large and growing very quickly. So we saw this as a great opportunity for us to um, start a business in. So the business strategy that we've implemented for this pro project has been a co-venture with Orgenetics, which is a vitamin company that sells organic vitamins and minerals containing ingredients found in fruits, <coughs> vegetables, and botanicals. So our plan was to sell resveratrol at a discounted price in exchange for equity in our genetics company. This is beneficial for us because it ensures an outlet for our product. In addition, it aids in financing a loan for us, and like I said, we get equity in their company. It's beneficial for our genetics because it gives them an opportunity to expand their portfolio and to get a discounted product with quality they can trust. In addition, they don't have to worry about processing, safety, design, quality control, we take care of all of that, and all they have to do is receive the product that we're giving them, and they know that they can trust it. So for our plant location, um, we thought initially about the feedstock. So our feedstock is muscadine grapes, and to start out, we'll be purchasing the grapes, but we saw this as a great opportunity to choose a location where the grapes could be grown. That way in the future, we can save money by growing the grapes ourselves. So we looked at the USDA plant hardiness zone map, and we were aware that um, muscadine grapes grow best in zones 7A through 10B. So that's the red box on the right here. And you can see that it's light green to dark orange. So basically the southern coast of the United States um, lining the Gulf of Mexico. So then more specifically, we zoomed up and we wanted to choose a location in Mexico because we have um, very intense labor in our process, including picking the grapes and hand peeling them to maintain skin health. So we wanted to pick a place that had lower wages. And so we chose um, Nuevo Laredo, uh, Mexico, which borders Laredo, Texas, and is in zone 9B, which is within the acceptable range to grow the grapes. And this location is especially great because it has close proximity to railways and waterways, which will allow us great access to resources and transportation. So here's our process. As you can see, it's very simple. There's not many parts. It's not a very hard extraction process. You begin with a grape holding tank. There's more information about this after, by the way, but there's, you start with the grape holding tank. That allows us to just take all the grapes that we've harvested, put them in one location, get them ready and primed to, uh, for the extraction process. The grape skin removal step, we remove the grapes, discard the, uh, the inner pulp of the grape, and we just keep the skins. Those are instantly refrigerated in our grape refrigerator to maintain skin health. Then they are blended and homogenized in a solution which helps us remove uh, the resveratrol. And then strained and condensed to remove the grape skins. And then further filter to continue to take out extra contaminants in the system. And then extracted in our uh, disturbed extraction reactor. Basically that just takes out and we get pure resveratrol coming out. We then uh, bring the ethanol back to the beginning and distill it back out to be able to be reused within the process. Ethanol is one of our bigger costs, and uh, we decided to add that process in later just to save some extra money. So the next slide, we have some more details about this process. That grape holding tank is five cubic meters. That allows us to really contain as many grapes as we would need to keep our process continually running. Then, uh, as I said, the grape skin removal, hand, hand removed, which is fortunate for now, but that's something that we, uh, as are we, get into profitability, we'll be able to look into getting automated processes. Then, uh, as I said, the great waste and compost, so we'll be able to send those pulps out to be used. They're very common in jams. They're also uh, can be used in just compost in general. So we'll be able to get an outlet of that and potentially an extra revenue stream for our process using uh, those wastes. 
So then the grape refrigerator, the grapes, as soon as they're skinned, are uh, frozen down to negative 20 degrees Celsius. This keeps the skin uh, intact, healthy, and allows resveratrol to be uh, viably extracted. Then the blender homogenizer uses an 80-20 ethanol to water solution. Ethanol is very good for removing the resveratrol from the grape skins. The, uh, it's not fully water soluble on its own, so we use that ethanol solution to get extra extraction out. The strainer condenser, then, oh, actually, well, we use one liter of solution per eight grams of dry skins. That's what we have a patent that uh, we used for a lot of our information. That's the that's the amount that they used, and we scaled that up generally to uh, give us a good good uh, general number for what that amount would be. Then uh, we filter using a steel colander, and then which basically just takes out all the the skins after the resveratrol has been moved. Those are then sent out where we can. Uh, Either we we'll probably have to discard of those unless they can be composted. They'll still contain some ethanol in them and other products that probably wouldn't make obviously make them good for using in a jam of sorts. But uh, you could still use that for potential compost if enough ethanol is able to be evaporated out from them later. So that could even be an additional revenue stream and also keep us eco friendly. They're then uh, concentrated using a 60 down to 60 percent using a rotary evap evaporator that just concentrates down that ethanol water solution with the resveratrol in it to make it easier for us to process it later. It is then filtered to remove out additional contaminants that may have been absorbed in that 80-20 ethanol solution earlier in the process, and uh, that solution is then taken out. That'll be in a potentially organic solution, and it might have some other contaminants that are found in grapes. So we would have to dispose of that differently than. Uh, some of the other processes that would probably be an actual waste product. So we would uh, have to figure out the exact composition of what that waste is and then decide what we would like to do with that. Then uh, we send it to the stirred extraction reactor that basically just takes all the rest of that ethanol and water solution out and allows us to be left with a pure resveratrol product. That ethanol water solution that's removed is sent is from our extraction waste up to an ethanol distillation where we estimate that we could get about 90% of that ethanol back using just simple fractional distillation of the uh, ethanol the water. That leftover product, which is our byproduct, which is basically just water, a little ethanol and some other uh, grape parts is sent to water and organic waste. Similarly to the waste from the filter, we'll have to figure out what we exactly need to do with that based on composition. It really depends on what uh, that final product looks like. But then we are able to take that ethanol distillation line and send it back to the beginning, saving us millions of dollars in purchasing ethanol per year. Ethanol is a huge cost for us. That recycle run line has saved us a ton of money by using that. So for the control systems that we will incorporate into our process, we actually do not need that many due to the very simple nature of our process. Um, we will be using a feedback control scheme placed on the jacketed reactor. Uh, the controlled variable in this case would be the temperature of the mixer. The manipulated variable would be the flow rate of the heating water to the jacketed reactor. And the disturbance variable will be the flow rate of ethanol into that um, reactor. Uh, we will also be using a fill close valve because we do not want uh, the ethanol to overheat to dangerous safe level, dangerous unsafe levels, and um, have any kind of accidents uh, associated with that. So our plant cost estimates. We use the Bridgewater and Mumford method. There's no similar process on this scale that we are proposing right now. So we can use a current plant as an estimate for how much money this would cost us. So that's why we use this factor method. Uh, we used a scale up from the 2012 data for the resveratrol market. Unfortunately, you have to pay something like thousands of dollars to get newer data for that. So we took the 2012 data, scaled it up to today using just the pharmaceutical growth rate. We uh, Obviously, that could be an underestimate just because the resveratrol market will grow more quickly than the overall market because it's not established. But in the end, that comes out to about $130 million today. And based on some other research we did for that scale up, that seems very appropriate for uh, compared relative to what other companies or sales are. So the USA market is 90% of that total world market, so 90% of that $130 million. And we estimate we could take about 30% of the USA market because it's such a new industry that we think we could really step in and uh, <laughs> we can step in and use uh, our, our new process and uh, our huge production capacity to take a significant amount of the market early on, especially with how good of a, uh, a uh, partnership we have with Orgenetics. 
And so our, uh, the number of reactors and selectivity was based on the, uh, the patent that I was telling you about earlier that we used for our process flow diagram. So that gives us uh, all the coefficients we need. So you can see on the next slide, it explains our Bridgewater Mumford method. So based on the amount that uh, 4.17 metric tons per year, that puts us in uh, one stage of the Bridgewater Mumford method. There's two stages. There's based on how much you're looking to produce. So that coefficient is just the number that they use for this method, but then our production per year is based on taking 30% of the USA market. The selectivity is again based on that patent. That's approximately how much resveratrol they were able to extract per gram of dry, dry grapes, so, or dry grape skins, I should say. So that would be our uh, general selectivity, and the number of major component parts is four. That's based on what the method uses for uh, major parts. It's things like, like our, uh, our big like extractors, that's a, a bigger part, where smaller things like our, uh, our steel colander don't really count as a uh, major component because it's just a, basically a metal, uh, metal, a perforated metal that just allows flow to go through it. So basically in the end, this gives us a, a total estimated ISBL cost in the Gulf Coast of just under $23 million per year. That uh, Mexico uses a coefficient of 1.03 just because of the smaller production capacity to be able to build this factory. So multiplying that by 1.03, you get about $23.5 million for our ISBL cost. We used a 20% estimate from our OSBL, which comes out to just under $5 million a year. That was at the recommendation of Bob Snell. He said that we can, we'll be able to keep a lot of these costs down. He assumed that many of these would be very high. He actually even said that these numbers are probably still a little high, but we think that since we're still able to make our process work with an overestimation, that we're very happy about that. And our engineering and contingency costs, both about $3 million. He said that our uh, engineering costs will not be linear with the total cost of the project, just because uh, our process is so simple, it doesn't require as much engineering as some other major processes like uh, oil refining, like he's involved with. So he said we should reduce that number down. He actually said we could even take our contingency down to about 8%, which uh, we elected not to do just to stay on the safe side. But even in the end, with all these costs, we end up with about $34 million for our plant, which as I said, could be an overestimate. But we do still think that we're able to find profitability and be very successful with the plant costing this much. So uh, we're happy with our, with our overestimation for the potential cost of this plan. So for our material balance, uh, we calculated this working backwards from the uh, amount of resveratrol we would need every year to meet our target market size of 30%. Um, so 30% of that target market would be 4,200 kilograms of resveratrol. Uh, working back from there, we would calculate that we need to produce 0.67 kilograms of resveratrol an hour. Now that is based on a schedule operating five days a week, 24 hours a day, in order to try and minimize costs associated with cleaning and shutdown and then the restart up of the process. Um, moving on, we have one over 250 grams of grape skin per microgram of resveratrol. When you uh, do all this math out, uh, we left out the unit conversions in the slide for simplicity purposes, uh, but that amounts to 2,680 kilograms of grape skin per hour. Um, and we also need 50 milliliters of ethanol for every gram of grape skin for the extraction. Uh, multiplying this by the 2,680 kilograms of grape skin an hour that we calculated in the previous equation, we calculate that we need 134,000 liters of ethanol per hour. Variable cost of production. So our major cost here is the raw materials at 7.8 million. Um, we calculated this based on a price of $225 per every ton of grapes that we needed. Um, we will, this price is slightly lower than what the market price is for the muscadine grapes. Um, we We'll work on getting this price down by entering a contract with a um, winery or a supplier of the grapes. In order to get this large volume, we will guarantee purchasing a certain amount of grapes from them every year um, for this slightly discounted rate. Um, our second major cost would be our consumables, which mainly stems from the ethanol. Um, for ethanol pricing, um, it actually fluctuates um, 
quite um, significantly uh, due to its use in the gasoline industry, um, needing to incorporate the ethanol in the gasoline. So we took an average number of $1.43 per every gallon of ethanol that we needed, which was an average over the 2015 um, year. Um, we also needed to add uh, about three cents per every gallon of ethanol uh, for transportation costs um, from Texas to our plant in Nuevo Laredo, Mexico. Our utilities costs were calculated using um, average statistics from Mexican utility companies uh, and calculating the amount of power that we need for our process. Uh, effluent disposal was calculated as 5% of uh, U.S. costs for effluent disposal, and packaging and shipping was calculated uh, using estimates from shipping and rail companies that uh, operate around Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, into Laredo, Texas. This gives us a total variable cost of production of $10.9 million. So for fixed cost of production, our main Basically, all these numbers stem from the operating labor, um, which is going to be $240,000 a year. Uh, so our plant is in Mexico, uh, partially because of the cheap cost of labor down there. Um, and all these other costs were associated with uh, the operating labor and maintenance, plant overhead, property taxes, rent of land. Those were all calculated as percentages of the ISBL or OSBL. And for byproduct revenues, we will also uh, be selling some of the byproducts from the initial process, so we'll be only really using uh, the peeled grape skins in our process. So we will be able to sell the guts of the grapes to um, other companies who will use that to produce jams, wines, um, etc. So we calculate that we can get about $500,000 a year uh, from those byproducts giving us a total fixed cost of production of $1.89 million. So our revenue estimates, as I said before, they're based on 90% of the U.S. market, which is then 30% of, or 30% of the U.S. market, which is then 90% of the world market. So uh, using that $130 million, as I said, this is a, an underestimate. So we will, technically our revenue will also be a slight underestimate but uh, we're still able to find profitability, so we're very happy about that. So our price was also then calculated using a 50% discount. What I mean by that is since we are selling through Orgenetics, we're not getting a retail price, we're getting a wholesale price. So we estimated that they will double the cost of, of our resveratrol product once they receive it. So we used the current retail price and halved it for, for the, the price that we will be receiving for it so that they can find profitability from our product, but we also find profitability as well. So to produce 30% of the U.S. market, you have to get 4,200 kilograms per year of resveratrol produced. That's a, it's a very, it's, I mean, it's a significant amount, but that based on our process, that's really not that much. We have a, the, a very good production capacity for the ability to do that. So our process has very, is very capable of producing that amount. And in the end, that would get us about $17.5 million per year. So we could expect to be even a little more than that, as I said, but $17.5 million is more than our costs, obviously. So to calculate our cash cost of production, we added up the variable and fixed costs to give us a CCOP of $12.8 million. Um, when you subtract this number from our revenue of $17.5 million, where you have a gross profit of $4.7 million. Um, working backwards from our initial capital investment of $34 million for all the startup costs and the plant um, and getting everything in place, uh, we calculate it'll take us approximately seven years uh, before we break even. So future business plans, it's important for us to, to think further so that we can improve that profitability. The, uh, well, the best way to do that would be by vertically integrating. This is something that uh, Bob Snell and I spoke extensively about for what our process would what we'd like to do with our process. So uh, the first would be we'd obviously want to get into the retail market. Just by getting into the retail market, we could eventually double our profitability because our revenues would double based on our estimates. Um, 
That would be good. We don't want to do that right away, and the reason why is because being a drug, this requires some FDA approval. We'd have to go through a lot of government agencies to make sure that everything is viable, whereas Orgenetics would already be able to do this for us because they're already a drug company. They have everything in place for to be able to do that. So it saves us time and a significant amount of time and money, as you can expect, from getting a new drug put on the market. So this is... Uh, this is eventually, once we, we get our basis, we've broken even, we've started to make some profit, we would like to vertically integrate into the retail market. We'd also like to vert vertically integrate the other way by obtaining our supply chain. We would eventually want to obviously control the supply of our own grapes. We want to produce them ourselves. This would reduce the cost of having to purchase them. We'd also have a guaranteed outlet from ourselves to have those grapes. We don't have to rely on anyone else. If there's a shortage of the grapes, we, you know, we're we're producing them ourselves, we would know that there could be a problem ahead of time, we can make plans. Whereas if a different company just happened to go under, had a problem with their process, that's a big issue for us because now we've lost our supply. So as we've also, as I said, as we've uh, reached, you know, we've broken even, we've made a little money, we would definitely want to uh, purchase land in the area to produce our own grapes, which is specifically why we picked the region, as Ellen said, why we picked this region of Mexico because we get both the benefits of both the cheaper labor, but also get the benefit of being able to produce the grapes ourselves. They're viable to grow there. The land is perfect for it. So uh, it's really the perfect location for us. So safety is obviously a very important factor for any process. So this is an analysis of some of the key materials that we're using in our process. So resveratrol can cause serious eye irritation, so it's advised to avoid skin contact. Um, this will be taken care of by wearing the proper PPE, so it's really not that big of a deal. It's recommended to be stored in a tightly sealed container at negative 20 degrees Celsius. So we have the freezer implemented in our process flow diagram that Kurt talked about before, um, so that won't be a problem for us either. We're also using ethanol, which is also a skin and eye irritant and also an inhalation hazard. So prolonged exposure to ethanol can result in organ damage, but this can also be avoided with proper PPE. It's also an explosion hazard in the presence of various substances. This is something to be aware of. Um, and that's more depicted in the MSDS, but you can see the NFPA diamond down there. Um, the fire hazard rating is a three, so that's pretty much the most severe aspect of it, but it's not very reactive, um, and the health is only a two factor. It's recommended to be stored in a well-ventilated area and not above 23 degrees Celsius. So just noted here that our plant is in Mexico, which tends to be very hot for you know. 80% of the year, but we will be maintaining our lab at uh, ambient temperatures and we'll make sure that we uh, follow along with that recommended temperature. So in addition, uh, I talked about PPE will be provided for everyone on site. This includes safety glasses, nitrile gloves, lab coats, respirators if necessary. Um, we also make sure to implement good plant operating practices. So this would consist of adequate training for all personnel. Um, monitoring the environment to check exposure levels. This includes toxicity in the air. Regular medical checkups for employees just to make sure that they haven't been inhaling anything. Um, the MSDS will be readily available on site. All personnel will be trained on where to find it, how to read it, and we'll also have off-site um, people like such as EMTs be trained on this as well. Um, we'll also make sure to properly dispose of our waste and byproducts. This is really important for the environment and we don't want to violate any hazards here. Um, we'll also make sure that safety showers and eye baths are installed in case there's any emergencies. So in conclusion, we will be producing 4,200 kilograms of resveratrol per, uh, per year. Um, this is again targeting 30% of the United States market as we previously mentioned. Um, also, we will have a gross profit of about $4.7 million per year, allowing us to break even after about seven years. And then for future recommendations, um, we would definitely uh, want to consider partnering with an additional vitamin company. And also, further, um, furthermore, we would like to expand our product line to sports drinks, nutritional bars, et cetera, like, uh, products like that. So those are becoming... Um, very popular now and it would be a great market for us to enter and it wouldn't necessarily be too difficult to make that transition since we already have the resveratrol. And then lastly, um, we did consider this uh, for this project initially, but it is very costly. So in the future, we could automate the skin process, uh, the skin removal process, which would allow us to reduce the labor costs and then also increase our production. So that would be a great way for us to improve the process in the future, but again, it would be costly. So maybe after we break even, we could consider um, automation. Questions? 
Did you do any sensitivity analysis around your economics? You, you point out that ethanol prices are, are driven by hydrocarbon oxygenate value in gasoline. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you, you picked a year that, sh that was the crude was ostensibly falling the whole year. Yes. Uh, did, did you look at you know, doubling the price of ethanol to, so, to, to, to see what it did to your economics when you break even and okay. so you, to, you, you premise an out you premise a market for your byproducts. Um, the other sensitivity I would have done was assume that it had to be landfill. Okay. You may may not be able to sell it. I mean, you presume you sell it, but, but those would have been the two sensitivity analysis I would have done to say what what happens to net present value, what happens to mm -hmm. what happens to point break even. So uh, for the ethanol, we uh, our process is inherently robust to sensitivity issues because we recycle almost 90% of the ethanol that we purchase back into the system. It means if ethanol randomly just doubled in price one day, that really doesn't affect us because only 10% of the ethanol in our system is actually new ethanol. So by the time that price fluctuates up and down, it really isn't a big effect on our end, on our end uh, the end of our system. Since we really, and we also uh, spoke with Bob about potentially purchasing excess at uh, lower times, basically, um, Hedging our bets against ethanol purchasing. If, if if it is if it's not material, you you're developing strategies to save non-existent money. I mean, if your point is it really is not. Yeah. A, it, it isn't a, an important. It may be costly, but it isn't. It doesn't drive my economics one way or the other. Then I wouldn't be evaluating strategies for uh, you know. For, Buying futures on it. Yeah, well, that's what, exactly. Well, that's recycling. why he recommended doing that before we elected to add the recycle process. But now we've we've made the there's the reason why we left that out of this process project is because uh, we assume that it's not our process isn't highly sensitive to the ethanol because we recycle such a significant amount of it back. And then uh, your jams, yeah, we you know we could have not uh, assumed that we'd be able to sell it, but uh, there is in the southern United States there is a fairly big market for. Uh, for uh, muscadine jams and uh, other products, so uh, you know maybe maybe we can't sell it, but uh, it's only five hundred thousand dollars, which was uh, the total culmination of all of our broad pot product sales, with revenues at about five million dollars. Now that's only ten percent of our our estimated pro uh, profit, which is and actually it's of seventeen and a half million dollars. It's only five hundred thousand dollars compared to seventeen and a half million. It's significant. We obviously want to keep that, but it's not a uh, significant revenue generator, so it's not a big deal that it that is brought in, and landfill costs wouldn't significantly chip away at that, that total cost. Just, just another observation is where you find cheap labor, you tend not to find how you train labor. Mm -hmm. So my argument with Bob would have been, I would have thought, go, go, go do it at Corpus Christi, where there's, there's ample chemical facilities and, and refineries and trained workers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and skilled maintenance people, and so dropping dropping something like this in a place that you'll be the only one, you're building a you're building a real hard maintenance problem, and a real hard operating problem. Yeah, the purpose of the labor, we don't really need that highly skilled of labor to run the system. As you can see, it was very simple. The labor cost that we were trying to bring down was the skinning of the grapes. That was the big issue because we'll have to hire tens, hundreds of people to do that. It's driven so, labor, labor like that. And I, I don't but that, that, that's why we ended up picking Mexico. It wasn't for reducing the labor costs of you know running the strainer or running the re like extractor. It was for the skinning of the grapes specifically. Okay. So. And how do you know that you're getting the pres 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 <laughs> And what type of testing are you doing? Uh, in HPLC farm? analysis is what we're doing. To, um, yeah, we didn't include it in, as one of the steps here. It's kind of just more of a characterization step after the fact. But once a resveratrol has been extracted, it's tested out at HPLC for purity, content, um, concentration, etc. And those tests are already developed, so that was like all included in the patent that we used. Um, we just, it's in our, I think we mentioned it in our report, but we just um, didn't include it in our presentation. But it's a standard analysis. So does it affect your yield at all? I mean, is it always we took in consideration um, the yield into our calculations, so the yield of the process. And actually, we actually sort of overcompensated too because what comes out is um, 
three different types of resveratrol, which are all which all have benefits, but we actually only use like one of the types in our calculations just to sort of like make overcompensate for it. So we might even have a higher yield than what we had to guess. Is there anything you can do with the other versions? Yeah, yeah they're, they, all, they're, the they're all beneficial. Right, they're all beneficial. So um, there's not like it's sort of just one that is more common than the other two, but all together they they're usually just all combined sort of together in the drug. Or not the drug, the supplement. The resveratrol had a storage condition of minus 20 in the? Um, that was for the grape skins. That was the grape skins. Yeah. Okay. Resveratrol itself is more stable once extracted. It, exactly. It's yeah, I did, I did notice that on the um, storage yeah. slide here on the uh, material analysis slide. Sorry. Okay, so no Yeah, it's, it's much more stable than that. Yeah. Don't need to consider that for like transportation, refrigerated, or anything. That was my concern. Yeah. Right. Okay. Go back to your material balance slides. Okay, so here is a one gram. Our, of our units are, are strange. We will just say, just prefacing, I know we talked about this in class too, like we didn't put the whole entire steps out because yes, it's a lot of the numbers are still the same from your detailed, uh, report, detailed design report, right? So one gram of grape skin is you know, 250 microgram of respiratory. But in the other slide, you said it's, 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 it's 0 0.000489. Yeah, that so is exactly what we're talking about with the three different types of resveratrol. The, uh, the 250 is for the main form, where the additional few few amount, like micrograms so of uh, resveratrol are from the combined. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. what I just mentioned. So yeah. for this, we were just trying to be more a little bit more conservative, and so we used only the main but there's also cyst resveratrol, and there's one other type in there as well, just in a lower uh, percentage. So, like she said, for conservative purposes, we use this value. And they do all have medical benefits. It's not like other drugs where uh, there's certain isomers that are active and others are inactive. The cysts and trans forms are both active for resveratrol. And you know, the revenues come from four isomers? <coughs> The revenues, so that they used a basis of all the isomers, but it, uh, we actually could have lost some of that in, in the cost. We actually would have over, then overestimated our costs for producing it. So, yes. Can you take your weight of grape skin and move that back to weight of grapes so that you know your, your input? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have a yes. set amount of per per mass that we needed for uh, zero point four. It's four forty percent of the uh, fresh weight of grapes is contributes to the grape skin. Okay. And then uh, there's another number that calculates the amount of dried grape skin you can get for every gram of fresh um, grape skin. Right. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.